Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 260 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the 21st century poltergeist. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. In late 2013, parapsychologist John G. Cruth was contacted by a medical doctor. The physician told him of a patient who was an 11-year-old boy. The boy seemed to be having inexplicable effects on electronic devices, and his family was desperate to get the effects to stop. It appeared that the boy was experiencing poltergeist activity, but it was of a unique 21st century nature as it was focused on the electronic devices we have today. So John Cruth dubbed the case the 21st century poltergeist. Well, what happened with the 21st century poltergeist? How were devices being affected? And what did Cruth himself witness when he investigated? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Jimmy, what do we want to say to begin today's episode? We've previously discussed poltergeists back in episode 195, so listeners can go back and review that one for a general overview of the subject. I also plan periodically to cover famous poltergeist cases and what happened in them. So today we're looking at a specific poltergeist case. It isn't famous per se, but it's a very recent case, and I know the principal investigator. His name is John G. Cruth, and he's the executive director of the Rhine Research Center and the educational director of the Rhine Education Center, which is how I know him, because I take classes there, and he's been one of my instructors. And he was able to witness a good bit of the phenomena reported in this case, so he'll be telling us about that. As you said in the intro, the phenomena were centered around electronic devices, which gives this case a kind of 21st century feel. So John named this case the 21st century poltergeist. Of course, there are other poltergeists also happening in the 21st century, but that's the name that this one was given because of its specific focus on electronic devices. And with that, let's go to your video interview with John G. Cruth. John G. Kruth is the executive director of the Rhine Research Center and the founder and education director of the Rhine Education Center. He's been a member of the Rhine Research Team since 2009 and is currently working on a number of research projects related to macro and micro psychokinesis, healing methodologies and their effects, bioenergy and other physical factors that correlate with psi experiences, applications and evaluation of remote viewing, and general extrasensory perception protocols and experimental methods. His background in technology has led him to provide the Rhine with the tools necessary to become a more global online organization that maintains a web presence, hosts an archive of the Journal of Parapsychology online, presents online educational events, sponsors the online Rhine Education Center, and maintains a media library of talks by speakers who have come to the Rhine since 2011. John G. Kruth, welcome to Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Always good to see you, Jimmy. Thanks for having me today. So uh, poltergeists are famous for psychokinesis, or mind over matter, also known as PK. Historically, poltergeists have been famous for moving things like objects and causing noises like raps uh, or thuds, and so they were known as noisy ghosts in German. That's where the word comes from. But in the 20th century, many parapsychologists began to suspect that a lot of poltergeist cases were actually caused by something other than ghosts. What's that? You're right. Back in the 19th century, well, even before, I mean, for hundreds and hundreds of years, people have noticed these strange phenomena where things were moving around them, either in their house or, you know, in different locations, and they thought there must be a ghost here because no one was moving it. But in the 1950s, and actually slightly before, but in the 1950s, uh, a man named Bill Roll and Gaither Pratt went to Seaford, New York, and they were exploring an unusual phenomena where this family had noticed that there were 
bottles that had the tops popping off of them in their house, uh, that there were things spilling over and there were objects falling over in different in different rooms. Uh, when their babysitter were there, furniture would turn over and they were they were sent there to invest from the Rhine lab in Durham. They were sent there to investigate and say, what's going on at this location? Is there some ghost entity there? By the way, something we need to know about? this is sometimes called the Popper poltergeist case or the Seaford poltergeist case. And I, I plan on doing a future episode of Mysterious World on just this case because of its pivotal role. Please continue. So while they were there, well, first of all, it was a very, very media crazy case. What had happened is the family was having these events occur and they didn't know what was going on. They called carpenters. They called people to check the wiring in the house and they called the police to say, can you help us with this? We don't know what's going on. The police sent a detective who did an extremely detailed uh, investigation and kept records of it. Well. After this got out to the media, all types of news people started coming there, and they contacted the Rhine Parapsychology Lab down in Durham, North Carolina, and these two uh, investigators went there. As they were there, they, they discovered that when these phenomena seemed to occur, there was one person who was there all the time. It didn't, it, sometimes it happened when the whole family was together. Sometimes it happened when a portion of the family was together. But there was a young boy named Jimmy, and when he was not there, it never happened. And the question was, well, could Jimmy be doing this and faking it? So they started watching and trying to determine whether he was uh, causing these events to occur. And they couldn't find any way that he was physically causing them to occur. But they never happened when he wasn't around. So they came up with this theory of Recurrent Spontaneous Psychokinesis. Psychokinesis, of course, mind-matter interaction. Now, many times when we think of psychokinesis, we think about people like uh, focusing very hard on an object and trying to move it across the table or spin a wheel within a jar, uh, having an effect on something that they're focusing on. But there's also this idea that it could be unconscious. It might be something that we're not focused on. It may be coming from another part of our consciousness that we're not aware of. And if we're not aware that it's occurring, and yet we have this connection to objects around us that we're causing to move or causing the tops to pop off of bottles in different rooms in the house, perhaps there is this unconscious impact that is recurrent and spontaneous, happens at random moments. So this idea of recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis, or RSPK, um, I'll, I'm sure I'll use that term again, uh, RSPK became a new model for the pol poltergeist, that instead of being a ghost that was invisible and was causing these events to occur and was terrorizing the family, that there was an individual, what we call a poltergeist agent, and that that poltergeist agent was having oftentimes some sort of emotional change in their life that was being repressed and it was coming out in terms of unconscious PK. So this was how the theory evolved. Now, I understand there's a difference between uh, how the terminology is used a little bit in the United States compared to the United Kingdom. Um, if you know spirits are real and are able to interact with the world, then they would have PK, just like living humans would on this view. And so you could have a situation where you've got a, an apparition of a spirit and it's also causing psychokinetic effects in an environment, or it could be a living human who's causing it. And in America, the term poltergeist tends to be used just for the living agent ones. And, and if there's a spirit involved, then it's classified as an apparition, even if there are PK effects. Whereas in the United Kingdom, if there are PK effects, it gets called a poltergeist, whether it involves a spirit or a living agent. Um, on both sides of the pond, my understanding is that most of the cases that historically have been called poltergeists would now be classified as living agent cases that 
both in according to statistics collected by British researchers and American researchers, the majority of poltergeist cases seem to involve living agents rather than actual spirit apparitions. Is that correct? Yeah, your differentiation is is um, very accurate. In UK, I, I, I would uh, describe it just slightly differently, though, mm-hmm. because in UK and in, in, in Europe, their first assumption is that there's a spirit involved. And they uh, explore it as if there is a spirit who is causing this activity. Whereas in the States, the first uh, traditionally, or, or I should say recent parapsychologists in the States, look at this first to determine if there's a living agent. Now, if you have activity that is not focused around an individual or even a group of individuals, if it occurs whenever different people are together, if it occurs in a location when nobody's there, even people in the United States are going to start to look at it as potentially a spirit if there's if spirits exist. We don't know. We haven't caught one in a bottle yet, despite what you might see in the movies. <laughs> um, so so if we, if the spirits actually exist, they could cause PK. And if there's no agent available, we would go to that conclusion because scientifically that's accurate. In UK or in, in, in Europe, their first instinct is it's a spirit unless there's an agent available. So it's just a matter of perspective on what you what your priority is. But we all come down the same way on this, is that if we find that there is someone who is always present, it's likely coming from that individual. Now, some people might interpret it and say, well, maybe there's a spirit following that individual and causing it to happen. Sure, you can say that. Maybe that individual is the spirit. Mm-hmm. You know, and it, it, because if if spirits exist and if they are the um, remnants of a living person, the ghost of a living person, soul from a living person, that means we have that in us when we're living as well. It just leaves or it exists outside of the physical form. So if it exists while we're in the physical form and it's having an effect outside, those same effects could occur while we're in the physical form. It occurs to me that in cases like to deal with the, maybe a spirit is following someone, and so it really is a a, a non-living spirit that's causing this, you'd want evidence to you know for the existence of such a spirit. Per Occam's razor, you don't want to multiply entities beyond what you need and to explain the observations. And if you're observing, okay, here's this, person that's at the center of all the activity doesn't happen when he's not there. Um, you'd want evidence for a spirit. And one form that evidence might take might be communications from the spirit. You know, if someone feels like they're perceiving a spirit and it's trying to tell them something, you know, pray for me or whatever it might be, that would constitute evidence for a spirit. But you need some kind of evidence for that if the phenomena is otherwise associated with a single individual or a small group of living people, correct? Sure, yes. We're always looking for evidence to support. Well, if we have a hypothesis, we're always looking for evidence to see if it's supported. Um, So we would look and say, oh, well, you know, is there any evidence? Has anyone seen an entity? in that location where this activity is occurring. So if objects are randomly moving around when no one's touching them, and someone has seen an apparition at that location or experienced an apparition, or if that if the movements are responsive, if someone's in that location and says, um, can you move that, uh, that little jar over there across the table, and the jar moves across the table, people may interpret that as if it's a spirit or a ghost causing that movement. But it's just as likely that the individual who is requesting that it be moved, they may be using their own PK unconsciously to cause that movement or someone else who's at the location. This is why the ideal case would be an environment that's monitored when no one is around. When there's no person and you see movement in those locations, that's when we start to say, well, it's less likely that it's a living agent in that situation. Okay. 
Now, parapsychologists uh, classify psychokinesis along a spectrum based on how large the affected object is. Um, if, for example, a poltergeist moves a book on, or a table, then that would be a large macroscopic object. But what other kinds of PK are there on this spectrum? So, so we often describe it from the experimental perspective. We often describe it as macro PK being things you can see. You know, a pencil whirls across the table, you know, or, you know, the jar moves across the, across the counter or something. These are things you can see, macro, visible. But there are other things that you can only detect using instruments. Something like uh, if, if someone's affecting microscopic objects or, you know, affecting bacteria in a Petri dish, you can't see this with the naked eye. We would call this micro PK. And to extend this a bit more, besides affecting these microscopic objects, they can also affect um, energies that we can't visually see. It might affect electricity. And if they're affecting electricity, if they're affecting magnetic fields, we're not going to be able to see this visibly, but we might see the effects in things like our electronic objects, um, our computers, our phones. And historically, people didn't have a lot of electronic devices, but now in the 21st century, we have lots of them in our lives, which opens up new possibilities for how poltergeist activity might manifest. Uh, we're just going to be talking in this episode about a new 21st century style poltergeist. When did this case take place and how did you first become involved with it? It was about uh, probably about nine years ago hmm? when I received a phone call. That we received a phone call at the Rhine from a medical doctor who said, hey, I have a patient and I don't know what's going on. He seems to be disrupting the phone at his house and seems to be breaking electronic devices. And I and his mother and his grandmother brought him in to see this is the doctor saying the mother and grandmother brought him into my office and said, There's something wrong with him. Can you check him out? Make sure he's okay. And the medical doctor checked him over. He was an eleven year old boy. He wasn't having any there was nothing physically that the, he could detect. Luckily, this medical doctor knew about the ride, knew about the type of research we did, and he contacted us to see if we could, if we were interested in trying to learn more, if we could help them, because they were they were worried about this young boy, um, for any number of reasons. Um, my first instinct, whenever I heard this, is, is this real? Are these people, you know, with the prevalence of paranormal state and the different TV shows and the different uh, investigations that go on on TV and in media, I thought, are these people trying to get on television? <laughs> What's going on here? Um, you know, I want to make sure they're sincere. So my first step was to make contact with them and spend some time and evaluate the situation to determine whether there was something to investigate. So. I know for reasons of, you know, client confidentiality, we can't say the people's names or give identifying details about them. But in general terms, what can you tell us about the family? I mean, who were the members? You know, where did they live geographically? And since the case was focused on a boy, how old was he at the time? So it was a little boy who was 11 years old, and he lived with his mother and his grandmother. And they lived in a rural environment, not so far from where I am in Durham, North Carolina. And the doctor was also in this in the same general area. And I was able to make arrangements to go to the doctor's office and meet them at the doctor's office. I wanted to essentially do a pre-interview before we decided if we were going to continue with this investigation. So we went to I went I went and met them. And it was clear within just a few minutes, they weren't trying to get on TV. They were very much of a, um, they were concerned. They were really worried about this boy. The doctor wasn't trying to get any attention. He didn't want his name associated with things. There was nothing like this, but they were legitimate. They did come to the doctor with this issue. And meeting this family, the um, 
they started telling me about the different phenomena they were observing. And the little boy said in the middle of the conversation, he said, I'm worried, and these were his words, that my electromagnetic field is going to hurt my granny. And I said, okay, this is, this is a sincere situation that's legitimate. Let's see if we can help these people. The grandmother uh, later gave you, now you published an article about this in the Journal of Parapsychology, and we'll have a link to that so that people can read it for themselves. The grandmother gave you a list of 31 different kinds of activity that they reported experiencing over a 12-month period before they made contact with you. And some of these occurred multiple, multiple times, but it's 31 different kinds of experiences. I won't read them all, but just to give the listener a sample of the things the family reports having to deal with on a regular basis were smoke alarms sounding when there was no sign of smoke, cell phones displaying strange behavior, including having the screen turn upside down and they took it to the Apple store, which couldn't repair it. Um television cha changing channels and volume increasing when no one was touching the remote control and eventually they had to replace the television because it just stopped working altogether even though it was only a year old uh, washing machine which was operated with a computer touchscreen lit up all the lights on the touchscreen and changed cycles rapidly when the boy was near it uh, eventually the washing machine stopped working completely so they got a new one but they always leave it unplugged and the boy is not allowed to be in the basement when it's plugged in and running. Um, the toaster oven heating up when the boy was near it, even when it was not turned on. Um, printers at school and at home and at the mother's work just feeding all the paper through without printing on it. Um, the check engine light in their car came on regularly when the boy was in the front seat of the car. Mechanics couldn't find any problems, and the light would go off when the boy was not riding in the car. Multiple computers at school shut down when the boy went near them. Uh, his teacher often made him use the oldest and worst computers, and he had to take his tests last so that he didn't interrupt the other students' ability to use their computers. So he was having effects at school that were causing problems for him. Uh, telephones would call back the numbers that had previously been called on them, sometimes over and over again, even though no one was touching the phone. The phone repairman could find no problems with the line or the phones in the house, and the phones had been replaced multiple times as a result of this. In the car, the miles per gallon gauge uh, changed values bizarrely to things like 99 miles per gallon or just two miles per gallon. and this happened on normal drives with the boy and the mechanic couldn't find any flaws in the electrical system. But if the boy's not there, this wouldn't happen. And also the car doors would lock and the electric windows went up and down when the boy was in the front seat and not touching the control. So this is a lot of chaos they're describing. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, I could imagine why they would uh, want these phenomena to stop. Yes. You know, it all started they when they first noticed that something was going on. Um, they started having some problems with the phones and they had the phone man come over and take a look. And he was checking things out, checked out all the wiring, couldn't find anything wrong with the phones. But they continued to have issues with the phones uh, ringing and there was no one there and, you know, beeping and things until one day his mother was sitting in their dining room. And the phone was right next, and the and this boy came through and walked past her. And as he walked by the phone, it beeped. And she said, "Wait a minute, come back here." He walked by again, and it beeped again. And that's when she started to suspect that it might have something to do with him. But they told me they got to know the phone man really well by first. He knew them by all and knew all their first names and knew their family because he'd been there so often. <laughs> and he wasn't the only one. They brought in multiple people to try to check out the problems they were having. I mean, I mentioned just from the ones I read, which is only a sample of what the grandmother reported, you not only had the phone repair man, you had um, the Apple store repair people, you had auto mechanics. They, they brought in other people to try to find natural causes for these things. Yeah, electricians, carpenters. But, and they couldn't find anything. No, they couldn't find anything that was wrong in the house that was reliably, that would cause this type of issue. And, you know, looking at when I, when I actually eventually went there, 
looking at things like their electrical box, everything looked like it was in normal condition. There was nothing that was out of ordinary in the house. But, you know, I'm not an expert on electricity on electricity i know a little bit but not not enough of an expert but electrician is and didn't find any issues either now poltergeists are a fairly uncommon phenomenon and as a parapsychological researcher and you in particular study psychokinesis um the chance to study a para, a, a poltergeist in the field would be very tempting did you have hopes of getting lots of new parapsychological data that could help us learn more about poltergeists, or what were the goals of your investigation? So, yes, I do study psychokinesis, but I study psychokinesis as a result of this experience. <laughs> Before this experience, I had very little interest in psychokinesis. Had I was not one of the main topics I was interested in at all, but it it started to occur right in front of me. <laughs> At that point, I realized I need to investigate this in more detail. My goal working with this family, though, uh, you know, yes, I wanted to see, is the phenomena real? Is there something going on here that is that we can record, that we can validate and verify it's really happening? But the goal from the family was, can you guys stop this from happening? Can you help us? It was causing a lot of disruption and within their, as you were mentioning, with all their electronics in their house, all these different objects were uh, giving them problems. And it was getting expenses. They had to replace the TV set. They had to replace their washing machine. They had to replace computers. The grandmother would not let him walk into the room where she had her computer because the last one blew up whenever he came near it. It just fried it and, it, and she had to get a new one. It wouldn't work anymore. So it was getting very expensive. But more than this, the little boy, when he went to school, was being treated differently. And the teacher thought he was breaking things on purpose. He was being ostracized and treated differently in the education environment. This was a real problem for him emotionally and for the family. And so trying to help to resolve that was my main goal. I wanted to honor what their needs are over any sort of scientific needs from the field of parapsychology. It's putting people first. From an ethical perspective, I felt that was more appropriate. So there can be situations in which, even though you'd love to, you know, bring in the lab equipment and do all kinds of tests, that's not what's going to serve the clients the best. And I know in the uh, field investigations courses taught at Rhine that I've taken, it's been stressed. Goal number one is helping the people who are in this situation. Mm -hmm. To the extent they're interested in, in helping research goals, that's great. But their goals and helping them with what they need, it takes the priority. Right. How would an investigation that focused exclusively on scientific research without taking into account the family's desire for uh, a reduction in the phenomenon um, how would that differ from what you actually did? What would you do if, if science were the only goal? There's a model that we could follow that came from a case that was uh, studied back in the 1980s called the Columbus Poltergeist case. And in that case, there was a young girl. This, you know, a lot of people think that these poltergeist things only happen to young people and only to girls. That's not true. These happen to males and females of multiple ages. But in this case, it was a teenage girl <laughs> who had these experiences. And uh, it, it was, uh, there were lots of objects that were moving around her quite often, and she was emotionally disturbed. In order to investigate that case, Bill Roll, who I mentioned was part of the first RSPK case, and a man named Jim Carpenter, who's a psychologist, worked together and took her away from the environment and did uh, psychological testing to determine her state of mind. They did. They brought her to a laboratory and had her try to purposely move things. They were measuring things around her, like uh, her magnetic field, measuring whether there were any electronic um, measurements they could make around her, anything physiologically that they could measure to determine if it might be what's causing this. Um, a man named Jerry Salfin also did some research with poltergeist agents where he checked their brain waves, put EEG sensors on their, on their heads 
and check brain waves to determine, well, is there certain brain patterns that occur when people are having these poltergeist experiences? Do they have a different brain wave pattern, different areas of the brain that might be active that uh, wouldn't be common for most of, most other people? So if we were going to do this strictly as a scientific investigation of the cause of the poltergeist, if we were trying to look at hey, can we determine the mechanism of this occurring? Then you might see something like you see on Stranger Things, right? (laughs) Where they bring these kids into a lab and they wire them up and they put them in these stressful situations and they try to see if it changes things. But there's ethics associated with these things that you don't see on the science fiction shows um, that they don't, well, you might see the ethics come out as we violated ethics and it caused a monster. Well, First of all, we're not trying to cause a monster, <laughs> but even just uh, working people, working a young child, a teenager through one of these sessions and going through this process in a laboratory can be very stressful and very disruptive to their development. Um, so this is one of the reasons that we kind of shied away from that in this case and focused on the people and what they needed. So since their goal was to get rid of the phenomena, how did you go about preparing for this investigation? I understand you contacted a number of people. Right. Well, having not done a poltergeist investigation before, really having not been involved with, and I told you PK was not an area that really was of great interest to me at that point in time, I needed to speak to other people who had done investigations, people who were familiar with these phenomena. And so I spoke to um, uh, Lloyd Auerbach, who's done a number of different studies of hauntings and apparitions and poltergeists. And I've had Uh, him on Mysterious World before. Great. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've also spoke to some people who were used to doing counseling because I knew that I was going into an environment with a family that was going to need some uh, understanding of what the dynamics of the situation were. I also spoke to a woman named Athena Drews, who works with children and is used to working with children as a psychologist. Uh, And I spoke to a poltergeist agent. At the time, I couldn't reveal who it was, but I can tell you it was a woman named Shirley Black. Oh, okay. In Canada. Um, Since that time, I was trying to maintain her confidentiality, but since that time, she has asked me to mention that it was her that was involved. She had her own poltergeist experiences and having a lot of disruptions with uh, objects and electronics. And whenever, when she got to speaking with different researchers, they gave her some guidance on how to uh, resolve this and make it easier for her to live with this. And so I asked her, what did she do? I asked her about the experience. So looking at people who had had similar experiences that were similar to what were being reported, those people were able to guide me. Speaking to counselors, who were especially ones that were used to working with children, they were also able to t- help me to learn how to speak with um, these children in this environment. And speaking to people like Lloyd Auerbach, who's used to the phenomena, has experienced it in different locations, gave me a, more of a historical background. All of these things together provided me with the enough uh, foundation that I felt confident to go into this situation and have, have a conversation with the family about what they were ex- experiencing. So how did you proceed with the investigation? I understand you and a co-researcher named William Joins uh, went to the house. Uh, what, what was the first thing that you did? I understand you, you did some checking before you even entered the house. Well, yes. And so Bill Joins, uh, he, he's an electrical engineer at Duke University. He's written lots of uh, books on, on uh, electrical engineering, specifically related to photonics and light. And he also has done poltergeist investigations back in the 1970s and in the 1980s. So he had had enough of a foundation that I felt like, this is one of the things, when you're doing these sorts of investigations, there's two things you have to consider. First of all, if you go into an environment um, and you observe something, you want to make sure that what you report and what um, what you record is, first of all, accurate. And you want it to be accurate, and the way to ensure it's accurate is to make sure we have somebody who's aware of the equipment and aware of what other types of things might occur with you. At the same time, you also want to make sure that you want to add some uh, validity 
to your investigations by having another researcher with you. So that it's not just John going off and doing his crazy thing and reporting on it. No, it's multiple researchers looking at it from different angles and being able to report it from different perspectives. Also, it's helpful to have someone else with you in case you walk into an unexpected, dangerous situation. In most cases, yes, when you're doing a field investigation, that's really important. In this case, I'd met the family. I had spent some time with them. I was pretty comfortable that where I was going wasn't going to be dangerous. So Bill and I get in the car, we take a ride, we go to these the this house that's out in the country. And the first thing when you're doing any sort of investigation like this is you look at the environment. And especially since there were so many electrical disturbances, I was looking to see, well, is there anything, are they near a power supply? Are they near under electrical lines? You know, I've, I've been to people's houses where they were underneath high powered electrical lines and you can hear the electricity moving by. Um, you can you can even feel it. It's palpable whenever you're near these uh, these type of things. So I wanted to make sure there was nothing like that there. And their house was pretty much isolated along the country road. There was no major source of power or electricity around them. No, no strong running water that might cause static activity. There's all types of environmental things we look at. And I didn't see anything in the environment. Really, their house looked pretty normal. Pretty normal one-family house in the middle of the country. Now, one of the things that has I've heard stressed in field investigation courses is that when people begin experiencing something strange, they become alert to it and they start to interpret everything that's going on around them in terms of what they whatever they think is strange that's going on. Like if if they think they have a poltergeist in their house, then everything that happens is, oh, I wonder if the poltergeist could be causing this. Okay. And so frequently field investigators, when they arrive, if they're competent, one of the things they need to do is look for the natural explanations. And they frequently find that some of the phenomena being reported are actually natural. Even if there is something paranormal happening, it's frequently coupled with other things that are purely natural that have been misinterpreted because of the kind of triggering effect of having something weird going on. Did you find anything like that in in this case, anything that you and uh, Bill Joins came across that was, did seem to just have a natural explanation? Sure. Uh, You know, this happens to all of us all the time, right? You know, if if I find like, um, you know, people in sports, they're crazy about these sorts of things. If they find out, you know, I ate chocolate before I went up to bat and I got three hits that day in the baseball game. They're going to eat chocolate every day <laughs> beforehand because they're making this association because of they think they're connected. Um, and it might be in some cases. But in this case, uh, they were spe- experiencing so many different phenomena and such a variety of phenomena that anytime something would seem to break or go wrong, they would immediately attribute it to this young boy. They would immediately say, well, where is he? Oh, it must have been him, which isn't good for his, his psychology either <laughs> being blamed for things that are going on so when i went when uh we went to the house and it was really interesting we went into their uh home and we sat down it was a very nice you know southern family we're hanging out together around their dining room table having a conversation getting comfortable with each other and because you know the, you, you don't just jump into the business right away we have to get comfortable we got to know each other a bit and I started asking them, so can you tell me a little bit about what you're seeing? And they said, sure, we're having problems with the garage door in the back that he's he broke it and it's not working right anymore. And I was like, well, show me. Let's go look at the garage door. And so they um, they said, okay, so here's what happens. And they showed me the garage door would open and then, you know, it wouldn't close and it would it would close and then wouldn't open. And he was standing there with us and they were saying, see what he's doing to it? Well. I'm no expert on garage doors, but I walked into the garage and I saw they had a little push button that would open the door automatically. And that push button was working. It wasn't consistently working. And it didn't matter where I sent him away and sent him to another part of the property completely and still had the problem with this garage door. The garage door was broken. Mm -hmm. (laughs) The electronics were broken, but they immediately made the assumption that it must be this little boy who was causing the disruption to the garage door. But I convinced them, no, 
you know, that's not what's going on. Is there anything else? And they said, well, maybe uh, he's been, he has problems in the car. You describe some of the things that happened in the car where the windows would go up and down and, you know, and that the um, gauges would do weird things. And so his grandmother said, why don't we take a little ride around in the car? And so she and this boy got in the front seat and uh, I got in the back seat with the other researcher and we took a ride around the neighborhood, just, you know, where his, showed where his school was and, you know, just where his friends lived and then drove back home while we're driving down the road. I don't see any changes. I'm watching the patterns on the um, electronic displays because they had described disruptions there. Didn't notice anything going on while we were doing that. But at some point, one of the windows just starts dropping, stops. And then later on, it just goes straight back up. And, you know, when this happened, I was, I was, we were looking, does anybody touching the doors? Is anybody touching the, gear, the window controls? No one was touching anything. Everybody said, no, 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 I'm not touching it. Um, but during this time, while it was occurring, this little boy's hands were below my field of vision. So I couldn't say definitively that he wasn't doing something manually to cause this to happen. Not only do the, does almost everything get blamed on the poltergeist agent in these situations, but sometimes the poltergeist agent feels a need to perform. And they might feel they have to show you that it's not, they're not crazy. It's not, you know, this, it's not that they're imagining this. It really happens. And in cases like that, there's a tendency, especially for a young boy or a young girl or a teenager, especially for someone to maybe fudge the situation a little bit, maybe do something and try to hide it so that you see it and that you believe them than what they're talking about. I'm not sure what was happening in those situations, but I can't verify that the windows were moving on their own because I couldn't see his hands at that point. Okay, so you found the garage door problems had a natural cause, and you witnessed this phenomenon with the windows, but it was inconclusive because you couldn't see the boy's hands at the time. Um, what did you see that you found hard to explain? Well, let me tell you, when I walked in the house, the first thing I noticed was that, you know, it was a very, it was, it was clear that they had kind of, prepared the house for a visit from from company right? as you do <laughs> right yes exactly and so we came in and as we as we're walking in it was something really out of place on their kitchen counter there was a big metal pot that was turned upside down just sitting in the middle of the counter and i didn't understand why it was there it was just kind of and so we sat down and after we talked um i i asked them i said um why is this pot here. And they said, oh, well, we put this here because the phone's underneath it. Because if we don't put the phone underneath there, it beeps all the time whenever he goes near it. But when we have the phone over it, it doesn't do it. And when we need the phone, we just take the pot off of it. I'm like, oh, okay, that's interesting. <laughs> and of course, and, and so they start talking about issues that they were having with phones. And they, the mother said, you know, first of all, he could not have a cell phone. Because when he did have a cell phone, it would behave erratically. It would do things like send so many texts so quickly to different numbers that the phone company could not see how it could find thousands of texts within a period of five minutes. It's, it's not physically possible to do that manually. So how was it occurring? The phone company couldn't describe it. And they actually had to... Um, have conversations with the phone companies about their bill because it's like, there's no way this could happen. This can't be real. And the phone company checked and said, it's really happening. It would recall their neighbor over and over and over again. And so, and eventually the cell phone got to the point that it wouldn't operate at all. So he used his mom's cell phone for a brief period of time. And one day when they were driving home from school, he was sitting in the passenger seat and he said, and, and his mom wanted to enter, entertain him a little bit while they were driving home. So she gave him the phone. By the time they got home, the phone screen had turned upside down. When they brought it to the uh, 
Geek Squad at the Apple or at the um, at Best Buy, I guess they brought it there and they had them check it out. They said, you know, we've never seen a phone do this before. We don't know how you could do this or what caused it. And they had to get them a new phone. They had they couldn't use the same phone anymore. She wouldn't let them touch her phone after that point. <laughs> These are reports. And and if you're a an 11 year old boy, this was in the year 2013. And if yeah. you're in the year 2013 and you're an 11 year old boy and all of your friends have cell phones and you're not allowed to use one mm-hmm. because it's going to go crazy and break, that's just going to add to the burden he's carrying. Right. It was definitely it set him out as different from the other kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you're a teenager, that's the last thing that many people want to be is different. They want to be, be able to fit in. Um, but in this situation, when, I, when we were at the house, her, his mom said, well, when I call him on the phone, then, you know, I can only talk to him for like two seconds. And then all of a sudden, it, I just can't talk to him anymore because we get interference. And I said, OK, can you explain it? And she started to describe it. And I said, well, which phone? do you use when you're calling them? And she had her cell phone in her hand. She said, this one. I said, and what phone do you call? And she goes, oh, our house phone. I said, you mean the one under the pot over there on the counter? And she said, yes. And so I said, I'm a scientist. Can we try it? (laughs) And so we tried it. And so he took the cordless phone out from under the pot. And, you know, we took the, took the lid off of it and, took the cordless phone and walked away from us into the other room. And she called him from the cell phone. And she, she said, hello, yes. Uh, and she goes, up oh, there it goes. And I said, there what goes? And she said, I, I can't talk to him. I just hear this noise here now. And I said, can I hear it? So she handed the phone to me. I held it up to my ear. And I heard what sounded like feedback. It was an interference pattern. It sounded like feedback. And um, I... My friend Bill, who's the other researcher with me, I said, can you do me a favor, hold the phone and um, let me know what you're hearing. And I walked in the other room to see what he was doing with the other with the cordless phone. Now, just to clarify something, feedback can often I encounter it sometimes when I'm calling dances and there's a lower quality sound system. It can sound like kind of a high pitched screeching noise. Was that what you were hearing or was it similar to that? Well, it was kind of growing in intensity and getting quieter and growing and getting quieter. Okay. Kind of kind of like if you were taking an electric guitar and moving it towards the amplifier and moving it away and moving it towards it. It was going, you know, like a, like a wah-wah kind of thing. Going okay. On. So this is what I was hearing when I held it to the phone. So I went in to see what it, was he doing. And I saw him in the other room with the phone. He was extremely frustrated. And he was holding the phone and kind of shaking it and saying, hello, hello, like, you know, very frustrated. And I, and so my first instinct is I feel bad for him. I want to calm him down. So like, it's okay. Everything's all right. Do you mind if I take the phone? No, no, no. So he gives me the phone. I take the phone and I hear nothing. And I say, and I say, Bill, can you hear me? Cause Bill was on the cell phone in the other room. And he goes, I hear you just fine, John. I said, great. Hang on a minute, Bill. And he goes, okay. So I give the phone back to this little boy. And as soon as I give it back, I hear Bill from the other room saying, there's that noise again. I hear it again. Just by having it in his hand, it was causing some sort of disruption that was that we could record was occurring. We did this multiple times with different phones, using different types of phones, whether they were iPhones, whether they were um, Androids, using different carriers because we had a number of cell phones there, saw the same result in each case. So it wasn't specific to a specific carrier, wasn't specific to a specific phone type. It was some sort of interruption in different parts of the house we did it, in different locations. But didn't matter where we went, when he was with the phone, anytime it was in his hand, we found this disruption. That was one of the first things that said, well, okay, there's something to investigate here. <laughs> we got to learn more about this. So in, in terms of investigating it, did you, now this is some kind of electrical interference. Did you use like an EMF meter to see, was he generating an EMF field or was there one in the room that could have been, or rooms where this happened? As I mentioned, Bill Joins is an electrical engineer over at Duke University. 
he brought some instruments with him uh, to measure whether it was magnetic disturbances or any sort of electrical fields. And it had it was like a wand, and you could move it in different locations. He had multiple ones, but one of them was a wand. And we were using this wand to determine if there was any variation in magnetic any magnetic field we could detect around the individual, around him. When he was when this was occurring, when it wasn't occurring, we didn't see anything that was unusual in any case. We couldn't detect any magnetic variations. We couldn't detect any strange electronic fields around him at, in any case. And yet the phenomena still occurred. I also understand the family, you know, reported problems with like their printer and their computers. Did you witness anything unusual in, that, in those regards? As I mentioned a little bit ago, his grandmother wouldn't let him near her computer. <laughs> Anytime he would go down, her she had a room in the basement where she would have her computer set up. When he went down, he would stand at the door. He would not walk in because she any she wouldn't let him walk into the room. In the room, she had her computer set up and she had a printer, and we were having a conversation. And he had um, written something that he wanted to print out, and he wanted to show to us what he had written. And so he went up to his room where he had a, a laptop, a new laptop he had just gotten. This was back, as you said, in 2013. Um, it was had a brand new laptop with brand new version of Windows on it. And he was really excited that he had just gotten this new laptop. And he had this uh, document he wanted to print for us. And it was connected to their printer downstairs wirelessly. So I'm sitting with the grandmother downstairs and the printer turns on and every piece of paper kicks through the printer, every single one of them. And they're all blank. And his grandmother goes over and uh, picks up all the paper that's just come through the printer, loads it back up, turns it off, turns it back on and one page prints. And I was like, I said, what happened? She goes, oh, that happens all the time. Anytime you print something, all the pages come through. And then I turn it off and it works fine after that. And so I'm thinking, okay, there's something wrong with the printer or there's something wrong with this connection. And so I had him try it again. I did it whenever I was in the room with him. I watched the same thing happen. And again, each time all the pages would come through the printer blank and then turn it off, reload the paper and the one document would print. And you're watching his hands to make sure he's not entering commands that could cause that. He's just hitting print, and that's you were able to verify that's all he was telling the computer to do visibly. Well, we had tried it a few different ways, and so I, I have a technology background, and I'm very familiar with laptops and things. So I sat with him, and I said, okay, let's start the computer again and, and, and start from scratch. When he went to reboot the computer, it started, it wouldn't reboot right. And he was getting really upset and worked up. And so I asked him, calm down a little bit. Wait a minute. I said, let me see the computer. I said, And so I, I just held it for a minute and I said, okay, now I'll try it again. He started the computer, it started up fine, no problem. But when he was worked up, it wasn't working so well. So anyway, the computer starts up and I said, okay, open that document. And he used a uh, standard Windows editor, opened the document up and watched, he pressed the print button on the, on the, um, on Word. And that's all he did. And downstairs, all the pages went through the printer <laughs> and then she turned it off and reloaded it. And then it printed again. I'm thinking there's something wrong with the printer. There could be so, a co connection problem. Exactly. And so I said, well, let me try. Let me see what I can do. So do you mind if I take your laptop and, and try to print it? No, no problem. I take the laptop from him. I follow the exact same procedure he did. It prints one page, no variation in the way the printer works. I did this multiple times. There was no change. Anytime I printed it, it just printed the document I sent. Anytime he printed it, it all the pages went through, and then the single page would print afterwards. So knowing a bit and examining how this network was set up, have, like as I said, I have a technology background. The only way I could determine that this would be happening is if somehow when he was pressing the print, if he was triggering something that was causing 
another network interception to occur that was sending a different command to the to the printer than whenever I was doing it myself. We were both following the exact same procedure and it, it behaved differently in these cases. And his grandmother, like I said, this happened all the time. Why would this why would he make this happen all the time when he's trying to print something? When you know, he just really wanted to print something. So and she wouldn't let him come in and get the paper whenever it was printed either. She no, stay out of the room. <laughs> She'd go out and get it and bring it back to him. And I did see as I went down to her office, I did see the washing machine that was unplugged <laughs> because she didn't want to, anytime when they plugged it in, they were afraid that he was going to break the uh, electronics of the washing machine because it had happened before. Did you see other unusual activity that they had reported taking place in the house? I understand there was something with like the smoke detector or CO2 detector. So while we were sitting there, you know, of course, we were we were sitting together for hours and talking about a number of different things. And he 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 walked by, he was walking back to his bedroom and as he walked by um their their bathroom, there was a smoke detector on the wall. As he walked by it, it went off, started making noise. And um I, I, you know, of course, I'm like what's going on? Is everything okay? and they acted like, "Oh, this happens all the time. This is just what happens here." When he walks by things, they they activate. Uh, in the other room, they had a weather scanner. And the weather scanner would just like go on whenever he walked near it and just at top volume. When he walked away, it would go off again. These were some unusual things. But one of the most strange things that I saw, we're sitting at the table together. And as I said, we're there for hours. And all of a sudden, I realized it's like getting to be close to one thirty, two o'clock in the afternoon. And I looked her and I was like, have you guys had lunch yet? Oh, this is my favorite story. I love this. <laughs> yeah, please tell this story. Because, you know, Bill and I, as we were traveling, we made sure that we were ready for the investigation. But I was wondering, and it was clear they, they hadn't had lunch yet. And um, it's a whenever I said this, the boy got really excited. He was like, can we have lunch? Can we have lunch? And so his mom said, okay, we'll make lunch. And so he went in the kitchen and he was really excited getting ready to have lunch and getting ready to get some food. And he was standing over near the toaster oven and he was just like really shaking his hands and just like, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. And the toaster oven warmed up. It wasn't plugged in. It got warm as he was near it as if the electronics had been activated. And I, I asked, has, has this happened before? And she said, well, you know, we've had other things in here that have done similar types of things, like their, um, the hood over their oven, over their stove. Um, would, it, it would, the fan would like kind of spin a little bit sometimes whenever he was in the kitchen. So it seemed whenever he was, uh, whenever he got excited, mm -hmm. when he got worked up, that it would affect objects that are around him. And when he was eating his lunch, he was eating it on a counter near that phone <laughs> that no longer had the hood, the um, big pot on top of it. And as he was eating near there, occasionally it would just start, it would just beep a few times. Um, I think one time it actually uh, started to play the message as if somebody had just called, nobody had called, but it started to play the message as if somebody had just called. And so they put the lid back on it and stopped. Hmm. That's an so that that's an indication that potentially this could be some sort of electrical field that's being generated that's disrupting the electric electric electrical devices around him. But we weren't able to measure it when we took instruments and put them near his body when this was occurring. I. This I is just, I'm sorry, this is a strange thing about a lot of these PK phenomena. When we see these things happen, it looks like it's electricity, but we're not able to measure electricity. It looks like it might be magnetic, but we're not able to measure a magnetic field. So it behaves in ways that things that we're familiar with. But when we try to measure it directly, we're not finding those um, those fields that, that are occurring. Yeah. I just I love that image in your of the little boy in the kitchen with the toaster oven getting hot because you mentioned in the article that he that happened while he was waiting for his mother to make him a sandwich and he was actually hopping up and down saying, oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. 
And I can, I, it, I just love the innocence of an 11 year old little boy mm-hmm. being that excited over a sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the, and the, and the toaster oven getting hot, even though it's not plugged in. Yes. <laughs> you know, that is, that is, that'll get your attention. Right. Well, and you know, the, and this was just, these were things that weren't unusual for this family. These things were happening all the time. And so we were, we made some record, we kept some records and kept some notes on everything that went on. Um, but like I said, we couldn't, find the mechanism for it to occur. And believe me, I looked, um, Bill, who was with me, looked through the house. We were trying to find everything we could that might cause this to occur, and we couldn't find a mechanism. This is when we say, well, we try to make these things go away. When they don't go away, do we just say, oh, well, let's ignore them and go on with our lives? Some people might do that. Some people might say, oh, I was imagining it, but we weren't imagining it. We had multiple people having the same experiences. We investigated in detail. It wouldn't go away. So can you ignore things that happen in your life on a normal basis? I could because I was going home. These people were living with it, though. It was breaking their television set. It was causing their brand new washing machine that cost hundreds of dollars. They had to replace it. Their life was getting expensive. Not to mention the psychological impact it was having on this child. Now, so it's normal for American researchers to have RSPK or recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis as their first interpretation, um, since that seems to be more common than apparitional PK. Um, Did you see any evidence of a spirit or ghost in this case? What was your ultimate conclusion about what was likely responsible? Well, my approach for this study was the, taking the foundation of RSPK being the phenomena, that there was a PK agent involved. One of the reasons that I accepted that so easily, because it was very simple for me to, to come to that conclusion, because this happened when he wasn't at his house. It happened when he was at his friend's house. It happened when he was at school. And when he wasn't home, it didn't happen. So it seemed to be following him. As we were mentioning earlier, unless there's a spirit following him, causing these activities to occur, then it was coming from him. And why would we add a second spirit into the equation at that point? It was apparent he was having some sort of emotional activity. And perhaps that emotional activity, when he got excited about the sandwich, when he got really upset around his computer and really anxious, I saw these phenomena occur. So if I could see it when it, when these certain activities occurred, it seemed very likely that it was related directly to this boy and his emotional state. You also had instances like where his, his laptop refused to boot and you helped him calm down and then it would boot. So it seems correlated with his emotional states rather than some spirit. You didn't have any apparitions manifesting or voices or anything like that. I wasn't, I wasn't um, recording electronic voice phenomena. I wasn't mm-hmm. trying to look for those things. There was no reports from the family of apparitions. There was no reports of any activity that they would consider, um, consider ghostly. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure that this family, I mean, they were a normal family. I'm sure they'd seen ghost stories before. I didn't ask them about it, but they didn't report anything like this. If they're not reporting it, it's it's it would be imp- inappropriate for me to insert it into the situation. What they report is what I was investigating. Now, after you had done the this phase of the investigation, you had a discussion with the family. What did you tell them? They wanted it to go away. They wanted to find a way to relieve the the burden on the family. They wanted to make sure that this wasn't going to be a problem at school anymore. So my, the whole reason for my visit was to try to help them through that situation. Once we observed that there was something to investigate, that there was a phenomena occurring, and it seemed to occur around this young child, the question was, how can we stop it? 
Um, so I start, I, we're sitting at the, their dining room table, and I just started asking them, do you know anything about meditation? Are you familiar with uh, mindfulness? Are, are these terms familiar? They didn't know anything about these things. They had never been exposed to it before. So I sat with them and led them through a really simple, very, very simple guided meditation, visualization techniques, and taught taught this young child and his mother and his, his uh, grandmother how to quiet their emotions through their breathing and to bring more, more uh, calmness into a situation and visualize something that would be pleasing to them to change their mood, change the attitude. I taught them these techniques just to say, hey, here's something you can try. When you start to notice that these things are happening, I want you to do two things. First, I want you to, as soon as you notice something happens, stop and think, what was I just thinking about? To make him more mindful of what was, might be a trigger for this event to occur. But then I also said, and then think, what were you thinking about just a moment before? to give him more of an idea of how these triggers might occur. And I said, as soon as you start, feel, start recognizing this, use your breathing techniques that we just learned to calm down and relax. Essentially helping him to learn to control his emotions. It's an 11 year old boy, remember. Emotions are gonna just get more stirred up over the next few years but finding a way to help him to develop tools to control his emotions. That was, this is what I learned from speaking to the poltergeist agent and to the different counselors I spoke to before I came, went to this case. And so I shared it with them. But in addition, I also shared something I learned from, the, from Shirley Black, is that by focusing and trying to purposely cause objects to move, that you may learn to control these events so that other objects won't do it spontaneously and unconsciously. And so I taught him how to make what we call a psi wheel, which is just a um, aluminum foil pinwheel that you put inside of a jar. And I asked, I asked him to try to see if he could focus on it and move it on his own. And I showed him how other people had done it in the past. And, um, but he never really warmed up to that. That really didn't have much of an impact. But the idea of breathing techniques, he loved those. I found out that um, after we left this investigation, uh, his grandmother contacted me and said, he is using those breathing techniques all the time. He loves to do this. And anytime he feels that he might be getting a little bit upset, he just stops and he uses these breathing techniques and relaxes and calms down. Something I want to clarify, uh, people, now meditation can occur in different contexts. Sometimes it's in a religious context like Christian meditation or Buddhist meditation. Mindfulness also, it gets that term gets used different ways in New Age circles. It sounds like what you were doing here, though, was just purely psychological, that you're, um, you're, you're helping him be aware of what he's been thinking when the activity starts. So he's learning his triggers and then he's using relaxation techniques like controlled breathing or imagining pleasant scenes or things like that. There's nothing mystical or religious or new agey about this. It's just psychological. Is that accurate? Well, yes, but what is mystical? It's really just things we don't understand. You know, so I, so I, and, and I'm not I, I, sure we understand exactly how yeah. these things work. What I, what I, what I mean is it's not coming from any particular religious angle. This is not tied to any particular faith or set of religious practices. It, it, that's very true. Yes. Um, you know, anytime there, there are different sorts of meditation. Some of them are directed towards a goal an intention. Like, you know, I want to, uh have have a certain type of experience, or I want to um, stop smoking. You know, hypnosis is a form of meditation with suggestion associated with it. Um, mindfulness, as you said, can be done in many different ways, but it's essentially at its, at its base, it's 
being aware of what you're doing at the moment, being mindful and consciously being aware of what's going on. This is what I was uh, providing for him, was a way to become more aware of what might be causing these things to happen and a way to not only psychologically, but also physically relax. Because a lot of these um, activities that we were describing, they can evoke any anxiety, excitement. They can evoke strong physical reactions in the body as well. And that's the type of thing that uh, could be triggering PK activity. I didn't know that this was going to, if this was going to have an effect. But it's some of the guidance I had gotten from other people. And it seemed reasonable that if he was able to relax and lower, if, if this was occurring when he was excited and emotional, if we were able to ha- control that a bit more, it may reduce the phenomena. I understand you also had some advice for his mother and grandmother when he wasn't around. What did you tell them? <laughs> Yeah, his, so one of the things that uh, when I was speaking to the child psychologist, Athena Drews, she mentioned that a lot of times the family's reactions can have a strong impact on the child and that the child can, um, if, if he's being blamed for everything all the time, that it can really have an impact on what he thinks he's doing and cause it to occur more. It's going to make his stress go up. He's always being blamed. Right. And so I talked to them and I I asked them to be aware that if something happens, don't make a big deal out of it. Don't act like, you know, oh, that's crazy. It's crazy stuff that you're doing again. Just act like it's a normal thing that happens in your daily life. If the smoke alarm goes off, go, oh, the smoke alarm's gone off again. Don't say, don't get crazy about it. So they agreed and they were, they were, very, very uh, receptive and saying, yeah, sure. And then down the hallway, as soon as this conversation ended, not really, it was less than 30 seconds, the weather alert system went off and she screamed at him and mom screamed at him down the hall saying, stop that, stop making that. And, and oh. I was like, this doesn't seem to be really sitting in. Yeah. What did we, it. what did we just cover? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, so I, I guess they're, they're trying to be more calm when this stuff happens. And the little boy, he's not interested in using a side wheel to learn how to control this, but he is interested in doing the relaxation. He's learning his triggers. So you, they, they're implementing a good bit of the plan. How well did it work? About a week later, when I spoke to his grandmother and she told me how much he enjoyed doing the breathing exercises, she told me, the phenomena had nearly stopped. It had dissipated. So there was almost nothing occurring anymore. And I spoke to her a week after that, two weeks after we had done our visit. And she said it had, there was nothing occurring at all anymore. He was able to use the telephone. He was able to speak to his mom. They didn't have, you know, uh, the phone beeping when he walked by. The smoke alarm wasn't going off. Everything had calmed down in the house. And then, they had a family dynamic change. Um, the a father who the father who was ex- estranged from the family came back into the picture and was in town, and they did not want to have him around the child. I don't know the details of the situation, but they had a strong family dynamic that changed. The family actually went into stress around. Not only for the little boy, but the entire family went into a stressful situation and they had to leave their home, go stay at a hotel, really isolate themselves. It activated a lot of a lot of uh, historical trauma for the family. His grandmother called me. This was about about a month or so after I'd visited. His grandmother called me and said, we're hearing loud noises. Could that be associated with what you investigated? Well, one of the phenomena that we often hear with poltergeist phenomena is loud banging noises occur. Loud noises occur in the environment around the poltergeist. So I said, yes, can you explain to me what happened? And she said, well, we were staying in this hotel room. And all night long, somebody was next door pounding on the wall, like beating it really, really hard. 
And so they went to the manager and told him somebody has been bothering us all night long. And they were scared because they thought it was the father who had found them. The man said, there's no one else staying on that floor. You're the only people staying on that floor. So his grandmother thought enough to say, well, maybe it's associated with this other event that's going on. There was a number of things that were going on similar to this with a lot of noise uh, and hearing things clanging around. And there was no one else on the floor with them. And and you could see how if if the little boy is terrified of his father is going to get him, his stress level is going to go up and it could easily take the form of noises sounding like his father is trying to get him. Right. And so I, I talked to his grandmother and told her, yes, what I would recommend is that he um, utilize his breathing exercises when these things start happening and start to do his visualizations and see if, if, if it makes it better for him. Shortly afterwards, the situation was resolved. All the phenomena subsided. Everything went away. And I haven't kept in touch with them to this day. I haven't talked to them recently, but I did talk to him about a year afterwards, and he seemed like a normal kid. Going to school, playing cello in the in their school band. He was just a really normally, naturally adjusted kid, and the teacher wasn't mad at him anymore. So whether this resolved naturally, as a, over a period of time, or whether this uh, relaxation technique, the methods that we implemented, whether they were what impacted it, it's hard to say. But for me, the fact that it resolved the situation and that the family was better off, that's, what, that's what's important to me. Because that was why I was doing this investigation, not to capture some weird parapsychological phenomena. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was about the people. Uh, something I, I was going to mention was that um, it's reported that RSPK poltergeists tend to resolve fairly quickly, sometimes in days, sometimes in weeks, sometimes in a few months. So, you know, it wouldn't be unexpected that this might have gone away on its own. But certainly the correlation between introducing the relaxation techniques and the very quick response that, you know, that's at least is suggestive that they that they played a contributing role here. Well, it's definitely an approach that could be taken by other people who encounter these situations. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you were mentioning at the beginning, we I named this the 21st century poltergeist because it was electrical disturbances. I don't know how many of you have noticed that you occasionally have problems with your computer when you get really worked up, (laughs) that your phones might, you know, for me, my phone drains, the the battery just drains like crazy when I get really anxious. And I never understood why it was happening (laughs) until I started to think, well, maybe I'm a trigger Mm -hmm. for some of these things. And maybe we're all triggers on these things. And there are similar reports historically. One of the things that I, I, I'm not sure if I've mentioned it on Mysterious World before, I may have, I definitely plan on talking about it in the future, was a kind of parallel case from the mid 20th century involving the physicist Wolfgang Pauli, who equipment, lab equipment would just break around him. And it got to the point other scientists would not let him use their equipment, just like the little boy's grandmother wouldn't let him use her computer or near her computer. And, you know, uh, it was so common for this to happen that even though he's a Nobel Prize winning scientist, this became known as the Pauli effect, your equipment breaking when Wolfgang Pauli is around. And so he might have had something similar. Even when he would come into town, <laughs> yeah, the, the researchers would be at the lab and or they'd be doing something. And if the equipment started breaking, they'd say, oh, Polly must be in town. <laughs> <laughs> whether, whether he was anywhere near them or not, that would, became that common that they would uh, talk about the Polly effect this way. And so the question that I had as a result of this study is, well, if, if he's having these effects whenever he's getting emotional and worked up, might other people be having effects on machines all the time? And is there a way to test this? 
And so I designed a study to test that. But we can talk about that in another episode if you want, Jimmy. <laughs> that sounds great. Would love to have you back. Mm-hmm. Anything else we should know about this particular case? Well, you see, and following up on that same line of thinking, if we are having effects on electronics, if people can have effect on instruments around them, we are electrical systems. Our bodies are electrical systems. Imagine the type of impact we're having on each other, not only by our actions and by, our, 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 by the way we speak to people, but just how our emotions can have an impact on the people around us and how it's very important to be mindful that you could be impacting people in either good or negative ways that might harm them or help them by being conscious of this in our daily lives we can find ways that we can live a more ethical and compassionate life and if your electronics are giving you trouble maybe relax and try again in a minute take a walk get get a cup of coffee whatever it is it calms you down and then come back to the computer and see if it works better So, John, we'll have a link to your article on this. It's called Taming the Ghost Within, so people can read the published uh, journal article you did about this case. Um, Where can people learn more about your work, and is there anything you'd like to plug? Well, the Rhine Research Center at rhine.org is uh, where where I post most of the work that we do. Of course, you can follow us on social media as well, on Facebook and on Twitter at Rhine ESP. Um, And so you you can find us in different locations. The Ryan is the oldest operating parapsychology lab in the country. And so we've been doing this work since 1935 at, when it started at Duke University. If you're interested in more information, go to the website, take a look around. Happy to have, to have you um, as one of, part of our community. John G. Cruz, thank you so much for joining us today on Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. Thank you, Jimmy. All right, now we'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Todd B., Jared S., Anthony M., Andrew E., and Christopher V. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by Catechism Class, a dynamic weekly podcast journey through the Catechism of the Catholic Church by Greg and Jennifer Willits. It's the best book club, coffee talk, and faith study group all rolled into one. Find it in any podcast directory. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by Tim Shevlin's Personal Fitness Training for Catholics, providing spiritual and physical wellness through personalized nutrition, workout and prayer programs, and daily accountability check-ins. Learn more by visiting fitcatholics.com. So, Jimmy, let's touch on this case briefly from the faith and reason perspectives. What would you have to say about the 21st century poltergeist from the reason perspective? Well, obviously, I wasn't there, so I wasn't one of the investigators in this case, but it sounds to me like genuinely strange activity was happening, principally with electronic devices. The repairmen and the investigators did a good job eliminating natural causes for this activity, and the case very much fits the description of RSPK, or Recurrent Spontaneous Psychokinesis. Is there anything to say about the 21st century poltergeist or other poltergeists from the faith perspective? The faith obviously has things to say about spirits, but we don't have evidence that a spirit was active in this case. Uh, When it comes to RSPK, the faith doesn't really have anything to say about it. Certainly, there's nothing contrary to the faith about the idea. In fact, St. Thomas Aquinas was of the opinion that what we today would call psychokinesis is real. Uh, We discussed that back in episode 105 and especially episode 106 on St. Thomas Aquinas and the occult. In his day, people believed in a form of psychic attack called the evil eye, which we will be discussing in a future episode. According to the beliefs of the day, as Aquinas put it, if a soul is vehemently moved by hatred, it can cause your gaze to become infected 
And your gaze can then harm another person, especially a child or someone with weak health, which is why it's called the evil eye, because it's your gaze of hatred or envy that causes harm. He sought to explain the evil eye in terms of the Aristotelian physics of his day, and we wouldn't employ that same theoretical understanding today, but basically he agreed that it was possible for a soul vehemently moved by hatred to have an effect on a living system at a distance. In parapsychology, that's known as demils, or distant mental influence on living systems. And since living systems are made of matter, it's often classified as a form of mind over matter or psychokinesis. Well, in cases of recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis or poltergeist activity, we're looking at something similar. In RSPK cases, the poltergeist agent typically is experiencing negative emotion, like stress and frustration. And it's subconsciously manifesting by psychokinetically causing problems in the person's environment. That's a different negative emotion, you know, stress or frustration rather than hatred or envy, but it's the same principle. A negative emotion leads to problems, including unintentional problems in the environment by mind over matter. So it seems to me that St. Thomas Aquinas's views are actually very consistent with the RSPK poltergeist model. Jimmy, what's your bottom line here then? The 21st century poltergeist is a fascinating case. Based on the evidence at hand, it appears to be a case of recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis, or RSPK. It involved some very dramatic and frequent manifestations of problems with electronic devices. And fortunately, it appears that the relaxation techniques that John Cruth was able to share with the family enabled them to begin getting relief from the phenomena, and thus to help bring about a swift and successful resolution for the clients. What further resources can we offer to the viewers and listeners? We'll have a link to John Cruz's article, Taming the Ghost Within, also information on the Pauli effect, and a link to the Rhine Research Center. So that's it from us. We would love to know what your theories are about the 21st century poltergeist. You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page, sending us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com sending a tweet to at mys underscore world, visiting the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord, or calling our mysterious feedback line at 619-738-4515. That's 619-738-4515. And I want to say a special word of thanks to Oasis Studio 7 for their video and animation work on this episode. Uh, they are available for hire, so if you have a need for video and animation work, contact them. Um, you can see examples of what they do, and I actually recommend that all of the podcast listeners uh, check out my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken, where we have the video version of Mysterious World. And while you're there, I, I am trying to grow my channel. We're trying to get up to 40,000 subscribers right now. So I'd really appreciate it if you hit the subscribe button and also the bell notification so that you always get notified whenever there's a new Mysterious World video or one of the other videos I do. So, Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? Next week, we're doing an episode answering patrons' questions. So we'll be talking about subjects like whether you can be possessed by an angel, the hollow moon theory, the Genesis flood and the Younger Dryas flooding, whether there are actually two Marys in the Raising of Lazarus account, how we got chapters and verses in the Bible, the Aramaic of the Lord's Prayer, the Philadelphia Experiment, Ouija boards, King Arthur, the Nation of Islam, and more. Excellent. Be sure to check out the Mysterious World bookstore at mysteriousworldstore.com for links to all the books and videos that Jimmy mentions in the show. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion on our show notes at mysterious.fm slash 260. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you by Fairvento Law PLLC, now assisting clients with expungements and set-asides 
of Michigan Convictions. To learn more, call 231-202-3321 or go to fearventolaw.com. F-I-O-R-V-E-N-T-O law.com. And by delivercontacts.com, offering contact lenses at low prices with free delivery. Visit delivercontacts.com. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest.